and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Dwayne Butcher of Lean Frontiers, and I have the privilege of kind of kicking things off today. You can also see on the screen our panelists for today, uh, who we'll introduce uh, shortly. Today's webinar is a lead up to the Virtual Lean Coaching Summit being held July 27th through 31st, in which several of our panelists here, as a matter of fact, have been an active part of that uh, Lean Coaching Summit. So if you are interested in learning more about that uh, particular virtual conference, you can visit leanfrontiers.com slash summits. Just a couple points of logistics uh, before we get started. Today's presentation is being recorded. Uh, look for an email shortly after we finish with a link to the recording, and please do share this with others in your organization. We will also be fielding questions. Uh, so if you would submit those using the GoToWebinar toolbar off to the right, um, I will say that we do have a fair number of questions already submitted. So we'll certainly try to get to as many of those as possible. So with that said, let me introduce um, our host for today, uh, Jim Hunsinger. Jim is the founder and president of Lean Frontiers and has authored books on lean accounting, TWI, lean economics, among others. So for now, Jim, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to you. All right. Thank you, Dwayne, and welcome everyone to our webinar today. And uh, we'd also like to uh, welcome our um, three veteran um, lean practitioners and thought leaders, Katie Anderson, uh, Crystal Davis, and, Mar and Dan Markovitz. Um, I'm going to have each of you just uh, introduce yourselves real briefly, but we're also going to start off with um, um, just for you guys to give kind of three kind of opening remarks as well. And then we'll jump right into the questions because that's what we're here for. And one thing I would like to say is, as Dwayne mentioned, thank you everybody who submitted questions. Um, we'll try to get through as many as possible. We've got a lot of questions in and that's wonderful. So um, maybe we'll start off, uh, we'll go uh, start off with Katie. Uh, Katie, if you just want to introduce yourself briefly and give a few opening remarks. Yeah, great. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Katie Anderson, and I have some exciting news. I am publishing a book that will be released next week. So today I'm sending my final copy edits to my editor. So it's really exciting. Uh, you can pre-order now. Learning to Lead, Leading to Learn. Uh, and I've written it about my friend, Isao Yoshino, who was John Shook's first boss and mentor at, at Toyota. And actually, connect the connection to the Lean Summit, or no, the Lean Coaching Summit, is I met Mr. Yoshino in the 2014 Lean Coaching Summit. And so it really started my whole uh, learning journey with Mr. Yoshino when I moved to Japan for 18 months uh, five years ago. I'm a consultant based in San Francisco Bay Area and um, coaching and developing people is my passion. So I'll, I'll, I'm looking forward to connecting with my friends, Dan and Crystal here and um, joining the conversation with Jim here today. All right, thank you, Katie. And to keep with ladies first, Crystal. Oh. Actually, we, we can't hear you, Crystal. <laughs> row, row. It's not, not usually a problem. <laughs> yeah. No, it isn't. Crystal's got the awesome presentation. Uh -oh. yeah. Still can't okay. hear Why you. Why don't we go to Dan and then we'll figure you out. Yeah. Uh, I'm Dan Markovitz. It is a pleasure to join you and look forward to hearing from Crystal. Um, Katie is about to publish a book. I'm uh, Shameless, shameless self-promotion. Just finished uh, and just published my uh, third book, uh, The Conclusion Trap. Um, this is my third book, actually, and uh, very, I'm very excited about it. It's uh, written, it's priced to sell, and it's only 75 pages. Uh, I wanted to see if I could tell a, a compelling story and give people some good tools uh, in something less than a bloated, turgid, 350-page business book. Uh, I split my time between uh, San Francisco and New York City, so I commute back and forth and actually have been commuting even during the uh, coronavirus uh, issues. Um, and that is all that anyone needs to know about me right now, unless you have specific questions. I think your questions are more important than what I have to say to you. All right. Thank you, Dan. Crystal, can we hear you yet? I hope so. Yes, we can. Wonderful. Good. What happened there? We did all the testing and all that good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So, hello, everyone. I'm Crystal Davis. I'm the CEO of the Lean Coaching Incorporated. 
and um, basically uh, do everything that both uh, Katie and Dan do. And really where I focus, or I like to say that uh, I have a, a niche is much like Katie, I focus in a lot on helping uh, people develop leaders at every level in the organization. I think that um, leadership is not about position or title. It's really about your uh, your ability to influence and how you work within the boundaries and confines of your group. And if we have leaders at every level, then we can develop real problem solvers at every level and people that are accountable and uh, are connected to meaningful work. And that helps to drive a sustainable business and sustainable improvement. So, so that's me. All right, thank you, Crystal. All right, so um, the questions that came in, we'll get started with that. Um, and what we we actually got together as a group to kind of discuss this about a week or so ago, kind of around um, you know what's going on in circum uh, the current circumstance, and you know even as we came up with our title, respect for people, leading teams through new realities. And one thing I know as we talked when we got on a week or so ago, um, it's it's really a learning experience for everybody. So um, even with with all three of them being uh, lean veterans. Uh, they really have as many questions as the rest of us do, but we want to have some discussion around that. So we'll kick off the first question is, um, so how would you guys um, maybe answer or discuss around balance, balancing the need for teams to produce and meet deliverables um, in this circumstance uh, with compassion for the uh, current state? And any one of you could just jump in and we'll just go with the conversation. All right, so I can jump in there. So, yeah. um, so I, I think it's, in, it, it's uh, incredibly important for organizations to establish effective leading indicators that give them more insight as to, to make sure that things are staying on task and, and be less concerned about managing tasks. I've heard a lot of organizations are, leading to man, are, are leaning towards managing tasks and they're losing sight of the fact of you know what are they actually trying to accomplish and what what leading indicators will let them know whether or not they're working on the right path. And so it seems like um, what what organizations need to be thinking about is balancing. You've got people at home with you know everyone's at home. The children are there. They're trying to keep the children actively engaged. Now that we're in summertime, not a lot of summer camps available. And so people might not be able to work with the consistent hours that they would be able to work if they were on site, but it doesn't mean that they can't be productive. And so it really the challenge is identifying what are we really measuring? What's really important? And if someone gets the work done at 8 p.m. at night because they finally got the kids to bed and it still moves the work forward, does it really matter? You know, Jim, um... I, when I saw this question and a lot of the other ones, it struck me that a, a common theme certainly is uh, is trying to be respectful of and considerate of, of the, the new constraints and new demands on people who are working from home. And I realized that an awful lot of the problems can be avoided um, by, <laughs> shockingly, talking to people <laughs> and asking them how they're doing. So to Crystal's point, um, you know, if we start focusing too much on tasks and did this get done and did that get done and when did it get done, um, that can impose an awful lot of pressure on people. But we can always balance that out by saying, hey, how are you doing? Is this okay? Are you, are you drowning? Um, now kids are, now, now you don't even have, the kids are not even doing, uh, you know, remote schooling what can I do to make your life easier? So starting that conversation, asking questions, finding out how people are doing, I think is a lot more important now than it was pre-COVID when, first of all, we got to, we had a sense of what the standard, uh, the, the steady state is. And also when we could see people not only formally in conference rooms and sitting next to us, but also uh, informally at the, at the, at the uh, coffee, the coffee machine. So I think there's a greater need now, a greater urgency, greater imperative to talk, to ask people, to check in with them and make sure that, there, that the, the expectations, the performance expectations are not strangling them. Um, and I think if it's done in a sincere, um, caring, open way, I, I, I think that that will lead us towards the proper balance. 
So great, great points. I want to uh, build on that too. That the it, as leaders of organizations, we both need to set challenge and direction, and then also provide the support and the nurture. And I like to call that uh, sort of the challenge and the nurture or the support. And we need to balance both of that. And especially right now, we people have a lot more challenges going on. So how do we provide even more of that support? And then secondly, I'm seeing a lot of the uh, organizations and individuals that I work with reporting, as Crystal said, a lot of task and micromanagement. And I think our, our lean principles can really help with that. I think because they haven't been created visibility of the work and really created an alignment on what are the what is the direction we need to be moving into in a way to then check check up on how the work is being moved forward. Um, and so managers who don't maybe have those visual systems or ways to connect or see the work in place are reverting to old bad habits of micromanagement and getting very task oriented. So how can we use our lean principles to help us in this new environment? It goes back to the same things, make work visible, have clear direction, um, as Crystal said, balance, and then you know show respect and ask about how people's conditions so have that challenge and that nurture as Dan said really connecting with people um, for their humanity okay good yeah, actually on the the other question it came in it was I kind of had put together this one this with this one and you guys are really already touching on it but maybe see maybe try to see if we could take it a little more granular in the discussion but it asked how how do how how do we use performance management or what does this look like in this new environment back to it it also relates to the question and realizing those out there working from home and so forth be juggling um, duties at home kids and so forth are there any particular things even going a little more granular you might uh, be able to advise people and they might consider from the performance standpoint you know in the soft oh, I'm sorry Crystal I'll, I'll let you go oh you no, first yeah. so you know I think about the software development world, which has used uh, agile sprints in, in two week chunks. Um, I think that that concept hasn't been adopted quite as widely outside of the software world. But what would happen if we started working in one week chunks, say? Um, and that way we're able to have um, shorter PDSA cycles. We had greater visibility into how things are going. Um, are we moving uh, at an appropriate speed towards whatever our objective is? But because we're not focusing on the task per se, we can give people a, we can get a temperature of how things are going without, without making them feel micromanaged. And I, I, I have a hunch that this idea of faster, um, free, more frequent check-ins, shorter PDSA cycles, but not so much on the task level, did you do this yet? Why didn't you do it, Crystal? Um, but how are we doing? And did we close this learning loop or this cycle? I think would go a long way towards towards helping people deal with the juggling kids and all the other things at home along with the performance um, uh, and while we're still measuring the performance as we need to. Yes, I agree with Dan. And uh, the, the one thing that I was going to say, Jim, is uh, for me, it goes back to what you actually measure. And so whereas uh, if, if this is driving people to feel the need to measure more at a task level, you might start to measure how people actually respond to great questions. So, you know, if you have those frequent check-ins with the with the sprints and you're checking in and you're noticing that some people aren't as engaged, you might start to measure engagement um, or lack thereof to be able to really check in on, well, you know, is uh, this person uh, doing really doing fine and progressing well? And how can I get some kind of information that lets me be able to, to measure that, but it also could be in showing up in a way that says, how is that progressing and where do you need help or do you need any support? And so instead of asking them about a specific task, you're asking them about their needs and how they're progressing so that then you can measure the response back to determine if you need to insert yourself to for additional coaching or additional support, but reminding them that you're available and open to, um, to, to evaluating if they need support or if and, and then I think it also goes back to knowing your people if someone knows that you're typically a person that doesn't like to ask for support then they they as a leader should be reaching out more to you in a way that says I'm here to support I want to remind you I know your personality type you like to handle everything but in this in this time of working remotely it's more critical that we communicate and collaborate more and it's not meant to to um 
to micromanage you, it's meant to make sure that you're you're constantly engaged. So I think increasing yeah. engagement factors is, is definitely the better way to measure performance. I know I, as you're talking, Crystal, that makes me think of uh, this this concept of you know pulling the and on how do we we let how do we respond in helping but not micromanaging so setting setting those clear um to longer targets and then trusting people that they will ask for help or going in and checking with them as well but so that they that we're not we're only we're helping when they need help um but not jumping in and doing the work for them and i think that that balance between micromanaging and sort of macro managing is sort of a, is, a, is a real balance for for leaders to have to to take can i, can I add one of the points to something katie said uh you mentioned you mentioned trust katie and i think that um that as as organizations are are struggling through working remote um much like technology would make bad processes <laughs> show up fast show up show bad results faster so will lack of trust in organizations so i think it's also unrealistic for people to think that they can have relationships and trust remotely when it didn't exist when they were in each other's business and so you all so that you also have to be thinking about not only pe people's personality and how they behave but how was the relationship when we were face to face Good. Now, actually, that uh, if you guys saying that, and Crystal, you kind of touched on this when you started off, and it maybe jump think of another question that's down here, way. So I thought I'd go to it. In regards to this, there they somebody sent in a question: is how often is too often? Her how to how do you how often should you check in with your employee or whoever you might be supervising, or how often should they check in? Um, I guess in this you know the new normal of working from home. Any suggestions on that? Because we're kind of already talking in a way in, in regards to that as well? I think the answer is yes. <laughs> I mean, it's situational, right? I mean, how often is too often? Who the heck knows? I think it's, it's, I, I think it's a leader's job to be, uh, to be cognizant of the needs of each person on his or her team. So is that once a day? Is and it every four hours? Is it once a week? Katie and Crystal, you guys are the leaders. And it's the same. Person. No, well, it's the same thing as, you know, it, yes, it's situational. And for example, you know, back in our old world where we were, you know, all together, leaders would have that same question. How often do we check in? What are this? I, I encourage people to think, what are the systems and structures that we put in place so that we have a routine and predictability? And, and people also know that if they need extra help, they can ask for it. So is the 15-minute check-in with, with your whole team, just like you'd have a normal regular model? How are we systems and like to keep work visible and that we're checking in so we know as a team are we winning or are we losing today or over the course of the week and then what are those one-on-one as well that are needed for coaching and development uh, and those are the exact same questions that we have um, regardless if it's in a virtual world or, or not so uh, I just think as you know Crystal said too what how do you how do you set those clear targets in the process and then how are we providing that support so that people can can admit it this back to this, con this quote that i heard from mr yoshino back at the coaching summit in 2014 which has really been my my mantra for what a leader should be doing it's provide that direction or support or sorry provide that direct direction or the targets and then develop yourself. And so we're also talking about how are leaders constantly developing ourselves to adjust our style, as Crystal said, or how to better check in with people as well. Um, so if we can do all of those, then we're really going to be able to be successful in whatever environment we happen to be in. Absolutely. I don't have anything to add. I think they both summarized it very well. Love it. <laughs> yeah. All right, good. Well, that, that looking at the questions, it made me another one that I because the conversation is going this way and what you're talking about. Someone asked, how does a how does a coach observe the learners? I guess maybe this might be whoever they're responsible for, their techniques uh when both the learner and a coach are working from home. So maybe you guys can steer the conversation in, in around that. So I'll I'll jump in first. So so that one actually for me was was probably the the easiest question because virtual coaching sessions have been around for a very 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 long time and i had this conversation uh on email with uh internal 
a lean practitioner and they were like, you know, how do you, how do, you do that? I definitely prefer things face to face. And I think it's about creating um, an environment. I mean, so the way that I look at this now is I feel connected to all three of you. I feel like we're just, we're, we're sitting in my living room or we're sitting at a conference uh, after hours and we're just chatting it up. And so I think it's about creating the environment that um, that allows you to feel that human connection, although you are separate and apart. And I think that uh, again, as a, in good coaching fashion, you want to set those you want to set those checkpoints that are appropriate. And it could just be that you know maybe there's a, a coaching session once or twice um, a month, but then there's email communication or Slack communication or you know something of that nature that's just a quick check in. I think there are plenty of ways also. So I've been doing virtual coaching for a long time uh, and, as well. And you can go see, we have our phones. You can have someone uh, hold that phone up or go see or go what they're doing or record a session and then debrief together. There are many ways. And I've actually been moving more towards um, shorter frequent coaching sessions with people so that they can have tighter PDCA. So 15, 20 minutes, a few times a week. What's the one thing you're gonna do next? Okay, what do you expect to happen? and then coming back. And so you, uh, and that helps break up the day as well. Sometimes we get stuck into, like, we're gonna batch our coaching into long sessions, which sometimes we need we need for different, for different reasons, but how do we get that PDCA mindset in the coaching as well? And then how do we use technology to really go see, and I really encourage people not to just do phone calls when you're coaching because it's, as Crystal said, we feel like we're in a living room here. I see Dan's face, Crystal's face, Jim's face, and we can we can see so much more um, than we can just hear as well. Great. Good. Well, I want to I want to maybe transition our conversation a little bit because um, with where we're at right now in the current circumstance, people are going through that transition of some are at home, some are going from home to work, some are at work now, some are at work with some of their other people still at home. So just from that transitional standpoint, um, a, question, one, a question that came in was, how do we ensure we're addressing the needs of those that are returning and those that continue to work from home? So we could start the conversation around that. That's a touchy one. I actually have a client that, um, that's in the middle of this this blended model and um, some things that some things have come up actually of course I won't share details but that have come up that you you know um, there there were things that I I didn't I personally didn't expect to see so there was actually some envy like why was though why was that department or group or person selected to come back in the office and what it showed me was that sometimes you are not cognizant of the fears that people have that maybe that means um, they don't consider me essential or maybe that means that I'm on a short list that might be furloughed if this continues. And so it was very uh, eye-opening for me that it's not just a matter of, you know, PPE when you return to work or new cleaning processes or, um, you know, uh, it might be that, that that team is working on some new and upcoming project, but it really is about thinking about the human psyche of what concerns all people may have. Some people may actually want to go back to work because they need a break from the house. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, there's so many nuances that have absolutely nothing to do with the work that can come up that I think uh, organizations need to think through and th think through with their HR department. The other thing that happens is you have some people who uh, respectfully might have great fear and trepidation about returning, given that they're going to be in close proximity with people that they might know and respect, but I really don't know, you know, how you manage in terms of, of safety wise or who you've been around that now I might be exposing myself to. So there's so many nuances that have cropped up in the last week and, you know, quite frankly, you end up in the closed office again. So it's 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 a topic that I I don't have the answers. I have a lot more questions than I do answers, and uh, I just will share that it was it was really eye opening to say, wow, you know, there are so many things to think about that have nothing to do with the work. 
Okay, good. Um, actually, you brought something up, and it's, this is another question. And we'd actually, when we were going through these questions, just talking about them as they came in here at Lean Frontiers, this, the question was, how do you help people feel essential and valued when they were temporarily furloughed? Um, and the question was, because they were in a non-essential job, although we were, we were kind of like, is any job really truly non-essential or it wouldn't have been there to begin with? So how do you, as you're kind of touching on how do you help people uh, deal with that or go through that, that no, it's everybody's everybody's essential. You know, it, it, Jim, when I saw that question, it reminded me of the Barry Waymiller story back in 2008 when uh, the economy cratered and they had a, an opportunity, an opportunity, that's not the right word. <laughs> they were faced with the prospect of laying off uh, scads of workers. And what they ended up doing was furloughing people. Uh, they put people, I think, on a four-day week schedule. Maybe it was three days a week. And they actually allowed uh, folks that were more financially secure to take, to take an extra day off and give and have people that needed the money work five days. Um, and it was all done with total transparency. And Bob Chapman said, listen, the company's existence, uh, it's an existential threat. Our existence is at stake. Um, we need to save money, but no one's being laid off. And when we talk about people who are being temporarily furloughed, I would say, hey, you haven't been laid off. Your job is coming back. You should feel valued, not in sort of this, how dare you question me kind of arrogant uh, perspective, but rather just to, to emphasize that we want to keep you here and we are doing everything we can to keep the company financially viable. And that means that there is going to be some times when people aren't going to be able to work full time, but we don't want you to go anywhere. You are important. And it worked out really well for Barry Way Miller, obviously. Good. Okay. Um, another question was, uh, what what if a person now prefers to work from home and they don't want to come back to, to the office? Um, any any thoughts or suggestions around around that? I say happy life, happy wife. <laughs> so if they Pardon? like it, I said I say happy life, happy wife, happy wife, happy life. So if they if they perform better. <laughs> And they say connected. I mean, is there anything wrong with that? Yeah, I would agree with Crystal. I I, I think that the this uh, unplanned experiment, a work from home experiment, is showing is pointing out what we actually are able to do remotely. And you know, if people are not spending two hours a day commuting or whatever the number is, uh, that's two hours that either they can spend working for you or uh, two hours that they can spend with their families and wouldn't that be great to allow them to invest a little more time in in, in their families or themselves or whatever um, I, I think as long as it doesn't compromise the integrity of the team and the quality of the work that's being done as uh as my grandfather would say gig is into hate in yiddish go god bless why not great well and it's the same thing like so what must be true to be for the team to be able to achieve the targets it needs to and then how do we create an environment and the system structures that support a different way of working so to not be trapped in the old mindset we may have to be creative and innovative about how we engage as team members but using our same principles about as you know we started off how do you have those clear targets how as managers are you checking in on people how is work visible how do we show respect how do we go see in a different way how do we create trust and environment and make sure we're all on the same page um, so again it's just how, think think be true to be able to achieve the outcomes that we need to and then create from there uh, and to not be stuck in an old paradigm and in some instances, it may not work for everyone to be working from home. And, and in many cases, there there may be. So it's a, it's a great challenge um, and disruption for us all to be considering about what is our new way of working while still meeting our customers and and, and part. So, so I would add so to this point that working from home doesn't mean in the future that you're working home five days a week. Maybe it's four days a week, maybe it's three days a week. It's not either or, it's both and, work from home and work at the office. Yeah. Uh, and who knows what the balance what? is. 
and that may change you know first week of the month or the last week of the quarter maybe it's all in the office but then uh, then people can start moving more work from home stuff into. I, I think the companies can figure it out as long as they're open to the and flexible enough to figure out how to make that new uh, flexible work environment work for them and what's what's amazing now is we won't be limited by geography per se. There are a lot of you know a lot of people in need of jobs, and now uh, it's like connecting people who might live in a different region with opportunities to work for companies who were um, physically located elsewhere. And so there are some companies who've been very successful with this dispersed um, distributed workforce for a while. And so I a really interesting opportunity too that allows for greater opportunity. Um, so yeah, I, I'm excited to see what's going to come. So it sounds like absolutely very sounds like very case by case, but to be as we do in a, in lean world, be very observant and analytical and just on what the, what are the circumstances and how can you make the proper adjustments. And uh, and because as you said, Dan, that can very much change week to week, month to month, depending on what the needs are. Okay, good. I think to, yeah. That um, I think too that uh, it's important for people to uh, to broach the conversation and to approach it like a business case that makes it a win-win situation for themselves, for the employee and the employer. Okay, good. The next question, I, again, I, I think so. All these are kind of paralleling with this. Would be any recommendations on what kind of a uh, the question is social interactions you would recommend. Um, for work events as people reestablish that, uh, I guess, face-to-face, -face, um, you know, being in, a, being in the office together and all that. Any, any type of uh, thoughts, discussion around that? Is beer an adequate answer or no? <laughs> good, good, good incentive, yeah, right. I mean, I think it's just also establishing clear um, guidelines and expectations. Uh, you know, we talked about people having different levels of comfort uh, in terms of in uh, proximity, and so we need to have conversation and expectations and have clear work standards for how we we'll engage with, with each other, just as we do um, at work in general. Yeah, you know, I think Crystal, you said something earlier that really struck me, and I think is relevant here, which is that. We don't know how people are going to react to being in an office with others. And mm -hmm. I might be really comfortable being six feet or five feet from you. Mm -hmm. uh, you might feel like, you know, 10 to 12 feet or not more than five people in a room or whatever the, the answer is. And I think perhaps the, the right question is not what kind of, or a better question might be not what kind of social interactions do you recommend, but rather uh, how do we make sure that, the, that people are not feeling uncomfortable? Because they, because everyone is going to have a different, or many people may have different levels, of comfort levels, and I think figure sussing that out in advance uh, would avoid, uh, can help prevent tension and friction and uh, and and unhappiness. Absolutely, and I think I think uh, in conjunction with that is, um, you know, we're, we're talking about respect for people. And being able to do so in a, in a way that's non-judgmental, non so that even if I am afraid, or it's not that I'm afraid of you, it's you know perhaps I have a spouse at home that is a cancer survivor, and so I need to be uh, extra mindful. And it has, and so it's it's really important to just make sure that the communication is open, and I shouldn't have to share those details. So just making sure that you respect those boundaries and right. that I have my reasons, but that these are my reasons and they're not reasons that are judgment against you or the other person. I, I like that point, Crystal. I didn't think about that. It, it's the fact that people shouldn't have to justify um, mm -hmm. why they're not comfortable. It should just be enough that we should be aware of the fact that people are going to have those different levels and accept it for what it is. Right, and not not feel like we need to be uh, to um, to be offended by it as it is a it's a statement against us. I think that's probably the most important message is that I may differ in opinion, but I still respect yours. Yeah. 
Very good. No, actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just read a question comment somebody sent in because I, because you guys are kind of already answering it, and I, but I think it summarizes what you're saying very well. They sit in, sent in one virus, but nine perspectives. Thoughts on how to respect the different perspectives, and and uh, and also response to stress of each person. So I think you guys gave good commentary on that, and you know, we kind of answered that. So yeah, it's everybody's going to be different. The circumstances are going to be different, and need to just be conscious of that and respectful of that. So um, yeah, and to that point, Jim, I think it's I think you I think organizations these are very serious. Uh, topics and conversations, but I think organizations can make it fun. So just like, you know, we've, we've probably all experienced the Myers-Briggs or other personality assessments, uh, whether it's Kobe or, or whatever it may be that just says, you know what, I, I, I am who I am. And uh, because I am who I am doesn't mean that uh, I can't respect who you are. And so I think that companies could make it fun, you know, um, you know, call me group no touch zone. <laughs> no Maybe touch I a red dot on my badge. Right. Instead of having like ENTJ, it might be eight feet, four feet, seven feet, exactly. whatever. Exactly. <laughs> and then I That's think funny. that also creates community, right? Because maybe I might be a lone wolf, but maybe there might be three other people in the organization that think like I think. And, you know, and so I'm not alone. We make fun make it a fun uh, experiment and uh, and we respect one another. Okay, well, well don't shoot this in here because you guys are already going that direction, but somebody did send in the question of, you know, what principles and practices um, are there, should we do that demonstrate this respect for all? And you're kind of talking about some, I don't know if you have any other ideas around that as well. Color-coded badges, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> people can hang out together all the red people get lots I mean, of room goes back to the, <laughs> yeah, the, the fundamental of recognizing the different perspectives and the, the same the same as today is um and and being clear on um uh, with once we set standards to ensure the standards are happening and and that's part of uh part of a leader's role as well so to not put the burden on the person uh to be uh having to police things if if you know if their boundaries are getting crossed yeah one uh if i could share one quick example um uh, my client um they use microsoft teams and so they were trying to get people to really express how they felt and and they tried to have some one-on-one -on -one conversations and some people were open some people weren't and so what they decided to do was on a on a friday all employee meeting virtual all employee meeting they had a gif competition and basically you could just share a gist of how you feel about what's going on. <laughs> and then, you know, people That's were voting the best one. And it, it was it was really a lot of fun. And um and it it was people were able to to state their position without having to verbalize it and get into to some kind of debate about it. Good. Mm, I love that. Yeah. With with that, any any maybe further comments on that um so i guess part of it would be you know people all going back to work together doing that what about something in that regard and this is a question um there's gonna how do you do that with some people at work and some people not at work but they still may need to engage together on projects or other things that they're doing together any thoughts or any experiences you guys are going through with some of your clients in that regard i can go Dan, you look like you have a. We can't hear you. That's the sound of me thinking. Um. <laughs> yeah. So, so Jim, right. some things that I've seen are people have, um, you know, if people were uh, users of virtual tools like Teams or Slack or um, Trello or Asana, any of those collaboration tools that allow you to share files to jump on a quick video conference or chat functions. Um, I've seen an increase in that. Uh, I think people are unfortunately kind of zoomed out. But but, um, but just, you know, if you need to have some quick communications, it's just, um, uh, that's what I've seen. I've seen more people go to those where they're creating channels to keep everybody in the loop. And then as, as it relates to a blended model where the, either people are remote and or in the office, 
um, and or furloughed involving those people in, if, if they don't have um, company computers, involving them in a, in a conference call once a week to just keep them abreast of what's going on. I mean, I think companies who have um, multiple sites uh, are, have already been dealing with this in the same way that having teams having to come together to say, communicate and collaborate in other ways, regardless if they're at the home office or if they're at distributed offices, uh, because they're actually on the work site, but in many different work sites and having to collaborate. So again, I think it's just, we have not let the circumstance be the barrier, but how do we let the principles of having clear lines of communication, having clear direction, having regular check-ins, all of that then can help us guide on the how to achieve that. So, um, you know. well, one thing I would add, uh, and I wrote an article about this recently, is uh, Crystal had mentioned people being sort of zoomed out. And I think being a little more mindful about what tool we're using. Um, mm -hmm. The temptation has been, or the tendency has been over the last few months, Zoom's here, let's make everything a video call. But the truth is, it is, and we've all read the articles, whether it's the Times or the Wall Street Journal or any other thing, any other articles. Um, video calls are fatiguing in a way that voice calls aren't necessarily. And I think it's worth spending t some time thinking about, is this something that can be done, needs to be done synchronously or could it be asynchronous? If it's asynchronous, what I do would be email or what I do it via dumping something into a Slack channel or a Teams, whatever the equivalent is in Teams. And I think being a little more mindful and conscious, uh, Katie, intentional, <laughs> um, since you always talk about intentionality, I think being a little more intentional about what tool we're gonna use for what kind of communication would go a long way towards making, towards integrating people without overwhelming them with yet another Zoom, uh, video call in, of, uh, or yet another phone call, whatever it happens to be. And I think that would also facilitate that cohesiveness uh, where people, even if they are furloughed, even if they are working from home or in a different location, I think they'll have a sense of, yeah, I'm connected uh, and it was awesome. I didn't have to be on four hours of stinking video calls today. Yeah, a great idea. Oh, I, I think they, can they up, you know, sometimes if it's just information that's going out, it could be recorded and then, you know, on a on a downloadable on demand uh, thing because people have kids at home or working different hours or across different regions. If it doesn't have to be something we're engaging on, how could it be something that people can sort of watch on demand and you, know, you have some check in to make sure that they receive the information that uh, but that it doesn't all have to be all of us sitting on a Zoom call at the same time with 100 people on it because we're not engaging there, how do we get that information out in a different way? So I think that's a great um, thing to highlight that, and the same thing, you don't wanna be sitting in meetings when it could have been sent out a different way as well. So what's the, it is the intention, what's the purpose and how do we align our actions? And then how do we very. Except for this, Jim, this uh, this one should be all video and it should all be real time and everyone should be tuned in. But you know, aside from this, we should be a little more mindful about it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, good. Yeah. Well, one uh, another question, and this just since we're all lean people, kind of bring this in. Somebody asked, "Do you think companies can adopt lean principles as part of their reopening, or do they need or should have had that in place pre-virus?" Any time, an opportunity to improve. <laughs> Obviously, the, the, the horse has left the barn if you're hoping to do it before the virus. So in a way, there's really not much of an option here. But what I, I would say, um, and again, Crystal and Katie, you guys are much more into the, the personal coaching and development than I am. But because the landscape has changed entirely, we have the opportunity to set it, to define a new normal because we don't really know what the new normal is. So let's define a new normal that includes whatever sort of lean principles and behaviors and concepts that we want to include, it's not going, it's likely it won't activate the same sort of fight or flight uh, reflexes, the old lizard brain, uh, that it would if we were in our daily routine with the daily process and the daily systems that we've been using for the last 12 years, now all of a sudden it's new. Well, if it's all new, it's tabula rasa, we have an opportunity to try new things and it's not gonna scare people off. 
Absolutely. And to Katie's point, anytime. I think as long as you are facing problems and challenges within the organization or desire to continuously or to make an improvement, maybe not even continuously, that you can start with, um, you know, how do you want to solve the problem? And you can engage people and, um, and start to apply the principles. I think that, you know, the key to what we've been talking about here is that we have to be open and we have to be creative. And we have to be um, relentless in wanting to solve the problem. Very good. Um, I'll, I'll ask one more question, then we'll go into wrap up. And I want to ask this question. It's it's kind of different, although it certainly relates to what we've been talking about, but a little a little bit different. At least I thought as I was looking through the questions. But the the question is, how do we teach respect to the younger generation? You know, coming back in, coming into the workforce, especially in, in spite of the before before this, during, and we're transitioning into that. So I guess any uh, any good advice for the, I guess, the youngster professionals out there? Not not that we are somewhat still youngster professionals, but. Perfect I'm timing. Just having one of those, those, uh, <laughs> working from home moments where my six-year-old just walked in, but uh, at least he was wearing clothing, which is not always the case. So I'm glad he had some pants on. Uh, <laughs> true, it's summertime. Uh, so sorry, I got distracted. <laughs> so I'm let the A lot of organizations are starting meetings just saying something embarrassing yeah. happened. Let's all acknowledge oh, yeah, it sure. and be done oh, with yeah. it. <laughs> well, as I said, so that's so it. So I, I'm not probably addressing your question, but this, this is something that's really important too. I lead a lot of coaching groups and workshops, and we say, you know what? It's okay. We we shouldn't. We are our whole people, and also especially from home. We have things that are going on. If you need to silence and get up and do something and things are going to happen unexpected. And 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 I, I think it's actually a really wonderful way for us to bring our, to reconnect with our whole humanity, going back to this concept of respect for people is that we shouldn't necessarily just be one person at work and one person at home. So how do we have all that? So next time, Katie, just tell them to come in and say, hello. Yeah. And then yeah. we'll say, do. okay, I usually do. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, a, what a great example what we're actually talking about actually happened why we're talking about it yeah yeah and i think i think i think you know uh, jim this is totally not even your question but i think that it's important for lead for leaders to to put people at ease because those are the stressors right uh, a friend of mine texted me she texted me a picture of a of a meeting at that was a virtual meeting that was happening at her company and the lady uh, had on a sundress with a strapless sundress. <laughs> Unfortunately, her camera angle <laughs> didn't show any of the dress. <laughs> and what she texted was the leader had no idea what to say to her. And I'm thinking, oh my God, like if my pants were unzipped or if I looked like I was naked on screen, how would you, what, what would you want someone to say? And I'm like, I can't believe that they're struggling to just, you know, send her a text message or a quick private chat and say, hey, you might want to adjust your camera. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like, I'm, I'm baffled that this is, this is something <laughs> that people struggle with. And, you know, you can imagine if, if the leader didn't know what to say, now what are her peers thinking? And now it's the, it's the, it's the, the, the elephant in the room that nobody's going to talk about. So anyway, what was your question, Jim? <laughs> How do we help the younger generation? Okay. Yes. Yeah. I, oh. Whip in a chair. <laughs> yeah, I think that um I think that um yeah, it's a great question. I think that what I would do and what I've what I've done with a few of the people at my client site is like this this is their jam, right? Social media, uh, virtual things, living in this world of internet, I would engage them to step up and help other people get comfortable. Good point. Okay. All right. Well, what's that, Katie? No, 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 it's all good. I was just adding a random comment, but Crystal had it. I was <laughs> 
Yeah. All right. Well, good. Well, I, I think we'll, we, I know we didn't get through all the questions, but we had a lot of good discussion. And, and with that, I, I think we'll go into wrap up. So I don't know if we will go through and just, if anybody wants to give any closing comments and um, um, we'll kind of wrap it up. So I don't know, Crystal, if you want to, if you want to start, start with the closing comments. Absolutely. So first of all, thank you all. Thank you for having um, me here. And of course, um, you know, Katie and Dan, it's always to, to talk with you guys. Dan, I know we just met maybe a couple months ago, but, um, you know, wonderful to be here. And Jim, love, always love what Lean Frontiers does. I think it's, it's always amazing. But, but what I would say is, um, you know, if I could leave with just three points is um, just to uh, apply empathy, engage, and trust. And that could be trust the process, trust experimentation, trust being creative, engage people in the process, uh, even if they differ. And then, um, you know, just show up as a human. That's right. Like Katie's son. All right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, reading a book is great. Uh, well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in there too. I, the, the door is open now. So they're like, oh, it's free game. Uh, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's it's challenge and it's nurture. And if we can look about how do we stay focused on the principles, we have to provide support. And how do we look, start with ourselves and, and look and, and continuously improve as well? Okay. Dan? Um, I'm going to take off my glasses and dramatically clean them to make it, look, make, it, make it look like I'm smarter or something. Um, actually, I think Crystal said something beautiful, I thought, which is show up as a human being. And I think that really captures almost everything. Um, but what I would say is that I think we are doing ourselves a disservice by assuming that uh, the fact that people are now working from home somehow changes anything that we've learned over the last however many years. I think it's all the same. Um, so now, instead of being in one building, we're in a different building. Instead of being in a smaller factory, we're in a bigger factory. Instead of using this machine, we've got that machine. Um, that wouldn't lead, those changes wouldn't lead to any sort of uh, a great existential debate about, uh, gee, can we still do this? And how would we do it? Can we treat this, as far as I'm concerned, we should treat the COVID changes like any other change. Hey, conditions have changed. All right, well, what do you do? You run an experiment. It's not super complicated. I mean, I, at the risk of diminishing the complexity of it, it's the same thing that we deal with every single day. Our biggest customer just left us. A new competitor just came into the market. What do we do? I don't know. You figure it out. You run an experiment and see what happens. Um, so I think that we can get caught up in, oh, the world has changed. It's pandemic land. Yes. And the world is always changing. This one happens to be a little more dramatic than most. Okay, well, wonderful. Well, thank you all very much for participating in this and sharing your thoughts and insight. Uh, I think a great conversation and discussion. And hopefully everybody listening or that will listen, um, you know, from the recorded part, will get these same conversations going at their in their own organizations. So thank you all very much and I enjoyed it. But also I will say this, I do look forward to when we do physically get back to our conferences and actually get to see all you. Um, uh, they're with us, you know, face to face, because we do enjoy that. Yeah. So uh, thank you, and I'll let Dwayne close it out. Well, th thanks, everyone. Uh, Victoria just posted, uh, thank you for this. It was a worthwhile discussion, and I, I certainly concur. And I really, uh, you guys touched on this, but there was this common theme through this, and I'll just summarize it as just respect for humanity, respect for what we're we're all going through, and and Dan, you just touched on this as well. I, when when the whole pandemic uh, started off several months ago, I had no question that our community, the lean community, the improvement community, would handle this with grace and boldness, and exactly in the ways that you all have described. And it has done nothing but confirm that we are a community that's that can embrace uh, those types of challenges. And 
not only embrace it, but we can be the leaders uh, of those who maybe are having some uh, anxiety and um, some unsuredness. So thank you all for your leadership and thanks for sharing your thoughts. Um, just, just a quick reminder uh, about the virtual Lean Coaching Summit that's coming up on the 27th. If you are interested in that, visit leanfrontiers.com slash summits and you'll find out more information there as well as a few other things going on. Thanks again to our panel. Love seeing each of your faces. Uh, again, like Jim said, I can't wait to see you in person. <laughs> and thanks to everyone who participated. Uh, have a great day and now go do good things. Thanks to everyone. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye.